Fabian Burst, who is sort of Harvard, sort of Munich, uh, because he just left uh, on uh, microscopic approaches to the Fermi Hubble, and we're going to hear about strings. Yes. And maybe is it working? Like this? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, I'm going to take right off uh, where Christian left us. And uh, first of all, of course, thank the organizers. I really enjoyed this conference a lot. I think it's a, it's a wonderful um, group of uh, experts uh, discussing you know, very interesting uh, new developments. Um, and so let me just start out with this slide. So I think um, ultra-cold atoms really come from quantum optics. And quantum optics has always been trying uh, to basically understand the individual constituents of uh, you know, what is around us, that is photons and atoms, and basically try to control them and understand them on the most fundamental level. And I think this workshop is really all about putting them back together and seeing interesting many-body effects. Um, and, you know, the BEC, uh, the observation of BECs um, was certainly the first time that many-body effects have been seen in this field um, in the most, you know, uh, dramatic form. And now quantum magnetism is, is starting to pick up. Um, and of course, you know, we've seen in so many references, these are just a few references in this direction, but there are, uh, you know, works really starting to explore um, this field. And so in this talk, I want to actually kind of go one step back and really use these paradigms of uh, quantum optics and, um, and, you know, basically study the individual constituents um, of these strongly correlated many-body systems. Um, and so, you know, those will really be basically spinons and chargons, what Christian was talking about. Um, and so in some sense, it's not the most fundamental level because we know that it's, you know, ultra-cold fermions in the lattice that really make up these interesting models. It's uh, one step further, uh, these, uh, you know, effective constituents, but these constituents are still on, on, in some sense on much smaller length scales than all the uh, emergent physics in the end that we get, let's say, in the high TC phase diagram, right? So this is really what I want to study. Um, this is a very brief uh, overview so that you don't get lost. Uh, I'll talk a little more on 1D first and then I'll move to 2D, first looking at a single dopant. Um, I'll always call it a hole, but you know, using the symmetry of the uh, perfect Fermi-Hubbard model, it's really the same as the Dublon. Um, and then I'll show some results on, on finite doping in, in 2D systems. Um, OK, so 1D. So uh, the key players I want to look at uh, are spinons and chargons uh, that Christian was uh, talking about. And I want to basically go uh, one step further beyond this uh, Ising type uh, model uh, that Christian was depicting of up, down, up, down and basically show one way of, you know, uh, a, a very simple theoretical way of describing the system, that, but, uh, you know, it gives rise to a different perspective on these systems. So let's consider a simple example without doping first, uh, a simple XXC spin chain. So the Heisenberg spin chain is if JZ, the Ising coupling, is equal to J perp. Uh, we can consider that case too. Um, and the way I want to describe this uh, chain is basically by replacing or representing these spin operators in terms of some fermions F. So um, every spin is, is a, a bilinear in these F fermions. And these F fermions um, are actually called spinons, OK? And the idea is that those will be uh, basically fractionalized uh, particles, if you wish, um, that carry um, spin 1 half excitations. And so you know, this is kind of different from uh, if, you, if you write down this model in this Ising up, down, up, down case, you would think the elementary excitations are magnons, where you flip a spin. But if you flip a spin, you'd always change the, the spin from minus one half to plus one half. So the change is one, whereas these F uh, particles carry a spin one half. And that's the idea. We want to uh, basically describe these fractionalized spin on excitations in this chain. Um, if we do this, uh, use this representation here, we have to be a little careful so we can do this. However, we have to restrict our Hilbert space uh, on this subspace where the, the sum of both spin components of these F particles is equal to one. And this is a constraint that applies on every single lattice side. Um, as a result, you get some uh, gauge invariance in, in this um, representation, uh, which is important. But so this is something that, you know, this basically complicates the story in the end. OK, so let's do this and re rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of these F operators. It looks pretty nasty, and I, you know, I don't want you to go through all the details. Um, but I want to basically uh, draw your attention to this particular reorganization of terms. And I, did it, I, I reorganized them in such a way, so you can see these terms, um, the two spin couplings basically, they're always um, uh, fourth order in these Fs. And I rearranged them in such a way that here you have F at side i plus 1 and i, and also here i and i plus 1. And uh, the cool thing about this is now we can do a nice mean field decoupling. And we can say that, let's say, this red box is a complex C number, the, this mean field term. And then we have a tunneling term between <laughs> neighboring sites. Uh, 
But the same is true for this term, and you know you also get the, the other uh, vice versa terms. And if you do this mean field decoupling, you actually get a quadratic Hamiltonian, which describes nearest neighbor hopping of these uh, fermionic spinots. Um, and you know that means you would basically get a cosine dispersion relation. Um, and because of the single occupancy constraint, uh, which we basically implement in this mean field theory on a mean field level, uh, you would think that the band structure, this cosine band, should be half filled in a spin chain. That means you have uh, upspins filling this half of the system and downspins filling half of the system. And the nice thing about this is you can actually see, well, the elementary excitations should be whole excitations in this Fermi C. And those are exactly the spin on excitations. Um, and now ultra cold atoms can actually start to probe these. Uh, spin on excitations. One possibility is, as Christian said, by basically doing, you know, for instance, kicking out a hole and looking uh, at, at this J cone. That's a way of directly seeing this um, spin on. And here we basically want to look at uh, a spectroscopic way, more in the spirit of Vazim's Arcus. So one way to do that in a quantum gas microscope uh, we proposed was to uh, imagine you have a full, fully occupied spin chain. Then you start to modulate and allow hopping into a, a, an empty spin chain. Thereby you create an excitation, you measure the momentum uh, of this excitation in the quantum gas microscope. Um, and if you do this, um, you, basically, and you, you basically ask at a certain frequency and a certain momentum, how many of these excitations do you create? You get an ARPIS type spectrum like this. Okay. Now, one branch you can see here is, is that's the charge on branch. So that has to do with this T cone that Christian was seeing. Um, but more interestingly, you get this very narrow band here. Um, so this is the width of this guy is J. And in fact, this half of this uh, uh, branch you can see here that's this blue dotted line, that's exactly mapping out the spin on dispersion that you get from this naive kind of mean field approach. Um, one thing to note, if you follow this line, you can see here there's lots of spectral weight until here. And then here you, you can see the line, right? There's no spectral weight. That, and that actually corresponds to this regime up here. And this makes sense, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to modulate and kick out one of these fermions. Well, up here there is no fermion, hence there's no uh, spectral weight down here, right? That makes sense. But if you look at this, what this actually shows is, you know, this directly measures fermionization of these um, spinons in 1D, right? Because in, in the, the sudden drop of the spectral weight is basically mapping out this Fermi, uh, uh, sur or Fermi, Fermi uh, surface of this 1D Fermi C, okay? So this is basically one way of seeing um, uh, fractionization in, in these systems. Um, and now that seems a bit odd, right? Because I'm telling you, uh, you know, you have a strongly correlated system of fermions, um, and we are describing it by a system of free fermions. Uh, so we kind of, it's almost like dropping the Hubbard U in the theory. And in fact, this is, um, you can make this a very well-defined and precise mathematical uh, statement by introducing a, a, a variational wave function. And all you have to do is you write down this Fermi C wave function uh, of, of independent up and down Fermi C's that we discussed. That, so this is the mean field theory. And then you do a Goodsfiller projection, which basically simply kills all the uh, double occupied terms. And it turns out in 1D, for these 1D spin chains, um, in a Heisenberg model, this is an absolutely excellent uh, variational wave function. Gets perfect variation energy. It's extremely close to the actual ground state. OK, so now, of course, the question is, can we do something similar in 2D? Um, and uh, you can do that. Uh, However, in this case, you, uh, it turns out it's, uh, to get a similarly uh, good wave function, you want to um, basically have a more complicated Hamiltonian for these uh, up and down spin knots. Um, and what you want to add is, is, first of all, a staggered magnetic field. So the up uh, fermions or the up spin knots prefer to sit, let's say, on these A lattice sites. The down spin knots uh, would prefer to sit on the down lattice sites. You introduce the staggered magnetic field as a variational parameter. And you also introduce a staggered magnetic flux. So this is really like, like a Pyle's phase, like in a synthetic gauge field uh, that these uh, spin on C. And uh, then the idea is to tune both these parameters. Uh, so this is uh, uh, you know, an old idea that goes back to 1988. Turns out if you uh, optimize both the staggered field and the staggered flux, you get also very good variational energies. And this is a more modern plot um, of this variational energy per particle. Again, it's very close to the true uh, ground state energy of a 2D Heisenberg. Uh, antiferromagnet known from Monte Carlo. Then you can see the optimum is somewhere here. Um, and so that corresponds to a staggered flux of, it turns out, something like 0.4 pi. Uh, and also you want a, uh, some staggered magnetic field. So let me uh, recall the most important properties of this variational wave function. Well, first of all, because we put in the staggered field by hand and basically uh, take this uh, z basis where it points up and down as a preferred basis, we did break the SU2 symmetry. And this is true. We know the ground state of the 2D Heisenberg antiferromagnet does break the SU2 symmetry, and that basically comes out of this variational calculation. Um, 
so therefore it also describes the long range order in the system and we get a nice variation energy. Um, on the downside, um, if you believe these mean field spin on uh, ansatzes, you would say, well, uh, uh, you know, that's what I argued in 1D, right? I argued that you can see these spin on excitations. Uh, in this case, um, the, this magnetic field creates a gap, so they're gapped, but they, the, the simple mean field theory still suggests that there, is, uh, uh, there are free spin on excitations with the, which carry a fractional spin. And this is wrong. This statement is, you, you can use basically some gauge theory arguments to show that this is wrong. Um, and so, you know, you have to take these uh, ansatzes with a salt of grain. Um, for th these variation wave functions certainly work, but there are no free spin on excitations in, the, in this long range antiferromagnet. Um, but uh, I, here, I basically, I still want to use this uh, theory as a starting point. The idea being that we want to combine uh, this whole story with holes. Um, and the idea is quite simple. So even though there cannot be a free spin on excitation on its own, uh, imagine what happens if you add a hole. So you have a, or basically a charge on and a spin on together. Um, so this is totally allowed. You can have a, a charge on which is uh, uh, basically bound to a, uh, to a spin on. And the way to uh, generalize these um, uh, parton constructions is by writing the original fermions as a product of a, uh, let's say, a bosonic charge on and a, a fermionic spin on as before. Um, and then you, you also get a constraint like before and so on, but you can basically write down a theory for these, these partons now. Um, and so those are really, in some sense, the analogs of quarks uh, in, in a high TC uh, cuprate. Um, so, you know, writing this down is easy, but the key question we want to ask now is, um, uh, oh, you know, th those are the key questions that people ask in the high TC context since uh, basically 30 years. Uh, do, do free partons exist? So can I see um, a, a free charge on or, or a free spin on that carries a fractional uh, quantum number um, at, let's say, finite doping? Um, um, and if, if, let's say, at small doping, if they don't exist, um, then what binds these guys together? What is the fundamental microscopic binding mechanism between these charge ons and the spin ons? Um, and uh, so in, in high TC Cooper, it's really the most promising regime uh, to, to address this question or where the people believe that uh, fractionized partons may exist is, is this, let's say, pseudogap or strange metal regime somewhere here. So in the antiferromagnet, we know these spin ons are confined. Um, but in this regime, there's reason to believe that there, you know, some exotic physics is going on. Uh, and the main, or one of the main reasons people believe that um, uh, is because of these Fermi arcs that have been observed. So this is a, a, an argument that Subir uh, Sachev likes to bring, so I'll just repeat it here basically. Uh, in, in the pseudogap phase, ARPIS measurements have been performed and they saw uh, at the edge of this magnetic prism, they saw arcs like this. Um, and you can see the, it, they almost look like Fermi pockets ex except that the back of this Fermi pocket is missing. And that's very puzzling. And so no one really knows what, what, is, what, what, what is the reason for this. But let's, let's imagine for some reason the spectral weight is just very low on this back side. And if you do this, you can basically look at the area that this pocket encloses. And you'll find that uh, it actually, um, it, it's actually proportional to the doping level, P. And this is a bit confusing because there's Luttinger's theorem which tells you that the area enclosed by a Fermi surface, if, if such a Fermi surface exists, should be 1 plus P, where P is the doping. Now, there are only two ways uh, around, or, or two ways how you can break this uh, Luttinger theorem. One is if you have spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that's, that's what happens in the antiferromagnet. Um, and, you know, we know there's, an anti there's a symmetry breaking order parameter. We know there's a nail order. Um, so that's, we're basically fine in this region. But in the pseudogap phase, there are no indications for an actual order parameter. So there's no reason to believe that there's actual symmetry breaking. Um, but then there's a second way uh, uh, around this Luttinger theorem, and that is basically to add some topological um, excitations to the system. And they can basically make, uh, or basically change this Fermi surface area. And so this is the main reason why people believe, or some people believe that in the pseudogap regime, uh, there, is some, there are some topological excitations in the game. Um, and the way to understand them is really, so those topological excitations come from breaking up the spinon into, uh, sorry, the, the fermions into spinons and chargons. And if you do this, I, I, I said before, you get these constraints. And the way to take care of these constraints is by having emergent gauge fields. And those gauge fields in the end encode these topological excitations that you need to uh, basically uh, satisfy Luttinger's theorem in the end. Okay, now, um, Let's say if you have these ingredients and you want to get some phenomenology like in the pseudogap phase, um, so Subir and co-workers, they um, suggested that one way of ex explaining 
um, this phenology of this pseudo uh, of these Fermi arcs is by having a state where you first take the electron, you break it up into these fractionalized spinons and chargons, and then you pair them up again to form a new bound state. And this, so these bound states actually carry the usual fermionic quantum numbers, um, except that now this this um, this gauge field is also round, and and uh, these pairs will also couple to this gauge field, um, and therefore the, when they form a Fermi liquid. Uh, this Fermi liquid is actually a so-called Fermi FL star, uh, uh, some exotic Fermi liquid, because in addition to these fermions, you also have these gauge fields around. Um, and so, you know, in terms of high TC phenomenology, this looks like a very nice picture. Um, but the question I wa really want to ask here, and I think that's a question you can really address with quantum gas microscopes, is what, what's the binding mechanism between these spinons and the chargons? And even, you know, even more, can we see individual spinons and chargons? And really, the, the way to address this is by quantum gas microscopes. OK. So now we're going to set out to try to see and understand the microscopics um, of this model a bit more. And so uh, to do this, I want to basically look at a single hole uh, in a 2D system and try to understand its microscopic, proper, uh, microscopic properties. And of course, so let me start by uh, you know, recalling some of the properties of these magnetic polarons. So this is basically, uh, Christian already sh showed, showed us that there's you have a charge, and around the charge, you basically modify the magnetic environment. So that's kind of a real space picture of these magnetic polarons. Um, and uh, in the study of cuprates, people always came from a different perspective because they do spectroscopy mostly. So they care a lot about dispersion relations. Say. Um, and so the dispersion relation of these magnetic polarons is actually very interesting. Uh, it looks like this. So this is a particular cut through the Brion zone, basically going from here to here to here and then uh, back here. And let me just summarize the key properties that are interesting. First of all, the dispersion minimum, that's here. That's at pi over 2, pi over 2, um, this red point. Um, second, you have a, a near degeneracy around this edge of this magnetic Brillouin zone. So around these red uh, corners, you, you, you are almost degenerate. And you can see that by the fact that this energy is kind of very close to this energy. So that's this point compared to that point. Um, and lastly, the bandwidth of this dispersion is um, given by, uh, or it scales with j. Th that's the super exchange energy. This is remarkable because in the end, what we're describing here is uh, you know, the dispersion of a single hole. And the hole has a tunneling, which is T. Um, so, so this strong dis <coughs> renormalization of the bandwidth to, to J definitely suggests that there's some more interesting physics going on than just a hole moving around. Um, also, if you just take a free hole, you would think that the dispersion minimum is at maybe 0, 0, or pi. pi. Um, but here, it's, you know, so this is very non-trivial um, properties. Now we want to understand them from a more microscopic picture. and um, what we're going to introduce are basically these chargons and spinons and a way how they can bind. OK, so um, the, the goal here is really now to write down a microscopic uh, variational or trial wave function for uh, uh, basically a bound state of a bosonic chargon. Sorry, uh, uh, here it's whole, let's call it chargon to stick to one notation, and then um, a fermionic spinon. And the idea is that they basically form a tightly bound state, and we want to understand and describe this bound state in the best possible way. So the, the starting point will be an undoped system. And the way I want to describe this here is by uh, projecting uh, one of these mean field states. So I start with some uh, mean field state, as I described before, do the Goodsfiller projection. Um, and then I add a hole. And so the way we do this is we basically take this initial state and we apply one of these original fermion operators. So we annihilate one of these uh, spinons. Uh, so this really creates a, a, a new free spinon excitation in the system. And we create one of these. Uh, chargons at the same lattice site. So this is both j. OK, and then um, the way I want to go about it now is I want to uh, calculate uh, or derive an, an approximate Hilbert space. And in this approximate Hilbert space, I then want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian and learn about the properties of this bound state. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the fact that the tunneling t is much bigger than j. Um, and that means um, the first type of fluctuation we have to add is the basically the motion of these free chargons. Uh, what they want to do is they want to tunnel around. And um, so therefore, we're going to just define a number of, of effective string states. And I want to label them by three labels. So one is j. That's the side where we originally created the spinon. Sigma is the spin of the spinon that we created. And um, this capital sigma, that's a string. So that's basically a configuration like you know left, down, right, something like this. Um, so this label encodes this, a particular string. And what we're going to do, we start from the state where spin on and charge on, are on the same side. And then we simply move around the hole by the string operator. And you know, this is just a way of, of saying you take the hole, you move it around, and when, you know, when all the spins that are in the way are basically shifted to where the hole comes from. All right. 
Um, it can be. So at this point, I didn't tell you. Um, what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to use an anti so it's uh, to you, so in the rest of the talk, I'll use the, the ground state of the Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which is antiferromagnetic. This construction in principle should work as long as you have strong AFM correlations in it, but you don't need long range order. <coughs> Does it answer the question? <coughs> right. Well, not, you know, the state, so the, the mean field definitely descri um, describe the, the philosophy of the mean field is to describe deconfined phases. That's true. But we, you know, nevertheless, we know that if you take a, a certain mean field state with, let's say, this long-edge order encoded, and you project it, you get an excellent trial wave function. So, you know, just the, the, there's no, I would say there's no one-to-one -one <coughs> relation between the trial wave function itself and the excitations and whether they're confined or not. That's right, yes. So the calculation here, I want to start with a state which, which has this long range AFM order and then basically uh, add the whole in, uh, into it. Right, so I mean, I, th I think the most important thing to note here is really I, I just care about the local microscopic details of this bound state of the charge on the spin on, right? And so as long as this wave function locally describes your spins, I'm fine, right? I, I, the the length, scale, I'm, length scales I'm going to look at are like, you know, maybe three, four, five sites. And so at that point, I don't really care about, uh, you know, those long wavelength properties that you described. So I, I think we probably should go on, but but I, I think I agree. So <laughs> what we're going to look at is high, some some sense high energy properties, and therefore the question you're asking is uh, not extremely relevant to what I'm describing here, right? Because we look at basically short distances. I agree with you at long. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So so now. Um, we do this construction. We have an, uh, an approximate Hilbert space. And uh, to show you the quality, and I was actually inspired by Silim's talk, also who talked about stars, what we're going to do is uh, look at the overlap of these approximate uh, basis states that I'm suggesting. And we start with Ising couplings. Everything is black except some of these little dots here. So those we understand extremely well. Those are particular loop configurations that Truckman discussed. The diagonal, that's trivial. Uh, so th you know, the fact that it's white means the overlap is 1, simply because the states are normalized and you, you know you take the overlap with itself, it, it gets one. And uh, on the right, you can see the same picture if we basically create this approximate state, but now in a Heisenberg antiferromagnet state. And you can see the basic structure stays the same. There's some gray stuff showing up in the background, which means the basis I'm using is not perfectly orthonormal, but it's a pretty good approximation to say the background is black. And uh, also these few dots that we have here, we know that those have not, they don't have a big effect. Um, uh, and this is a very well controlled thing to to deal with those, right? So, so that just means it's a pretty decent approximation. Okay, now how can we um, uh, continue? So the idea is, um, basically, so first I want to make a comment about the nature of these effective string states that we use as, as basis states. And um, so this is really a generalization of this concept of squeeze space that Christian was describing in 1D. So the idea is, um, remember in squeeze space you can take the spins and you just basically remove the holes. 
we want to do the same uh, and basically look at the spins before the holes have moved in some sense. Um, so basically when the chargons and the spinons occupy the same lattice site, and then we label the spins by where they are. So for example, this spin here, before this chargon had, has moved along the spin, has, has, uh, is located on site 2, 4, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever spin background we have, and we're going to move the chargon around along, let's say, a string like this. And you can see we, we will keep the labels of these background spins exactly the same, but then their relation to where they are in the actual real space lattice is going to be changed. For instance, the spin labeled by 2, 4 is now sitting at site 3, 4. Uh, and just because of the fact that these, uh, these spins mess up the geometry of the, of the system. OK, now we have these effective uh, string Hilbert space. And so the Hilbert space you can really think of as a beta lattice. The origin here is when the charge on and the spin on occupy the same site. And then you get a first a set of states when the charge on moves to the right or up or left. And then at each point, you can continue the string and again move up or right or left and, and whatnot. But then basically, this um, beta lattice that you get, that encodes the structure of our effective uh, Hilbert space. Um, and on the links of this beta lattice, we have tunneling T. And th that's really the fluctuations of these chargons. Um, and in addition, we know that when we move around these spins, um, that costs energy. That's also what Christian mentioned. Um, and so in this particular case, imagine you have any spin background. Um, and you move this around, you can calculate how much energy it approximately costs uh, because you know now this guy is neighboring this spin. So you, the spin exchange is uh, uh, the spin exchange coupling J times S dot S. And now, of course, this is exactly the spin correlation uh, on these two sides. So therefore, the, the string tension we get, uh, so the potential of, of the string, we say is approximately linear to the length of these strings. And the prefactor, that's the string tension, is going to be given by the super exchange coupling times a function of these um, correlators of the spins in the undoped uh, spin background. Mm -hmm. So, Adrian, why is it a beta lattice? Can't you go around twice and, uh -huh. and, and get back to where you are or something? Right, so there are some loop configurations where you basically uh, overcount. So, the idea is we're using, uh, the basis we're using is not exact, and th those were these, these bright do uh, dots in the, the picture before. Mm -hmm. But it turns out, you know, those are a few out of exponentially many states, so it's pretty fine to neglect them. Um, that's the short answer, yeah, right. But you're right. In principle, there should, some weird terms uh, would be there. But you know, those are just a few out of exponentially many, so they don't really change the physics. OK, now um, the way we describe this bound state is like this. We have a, a spin on and a, and a charge on. And um, so this basically encodes this change of the geometry, uh, basically the, the fluctuating um, strings. So this is really a superposition of all the different types of string states on this beta lattice. We have to describe the spin on. Um, and if, if the spin on is slow, we can always say that the spin on is basically fixed. And we, we, these fluctuations kind of dominate. That's a strong coupling approximation. And we also have to say what the background is. And in our case, we always started from this ground state of this uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And so what we get out of this uh, simple calculation is basically, most importantly, a string length distribution function. So basically, this is the string length. And this is the probability to find a certain string length. And you can see. Um, this depends strongly on the ratio of tunneling over super exchange, right? If it's small, it's a very uh, short string. And if it's large, you have a broad string. OK, now uh, we can make this a bit more formal and write this into a more honest you know, trial wave function. And the um, way we do this is we take the mean feed state. We create uh, one of these spinons at some side uh, j spinon. Then we good filler project it. And then we add these um, string terms here. But, and that, those are really the fluctuations of these charge ons according to the string length distribution that we uh, showed before. Um, so this is basically a lot in, this, in Anderson's RVB paradigm, except you know, we can add this long range antiferromagnetic order. And these fluctuating strings, in that sense, really go beyond this uh, RVB paradigm, um, because we, you basically allow the charges and the spinons to, uh, to have certain fluctuations. And then we take a superposition of all different uh, spinon positions. That's the kind of center of mass of the spawn state. Um, and thereby, we can also include the total momentum of these magnetic polarons. Um, so one thing I would like to point out, which I find funny, is you, now you would expect that the dispersion relation of this bound state should be determined by this heavy spin-on, right? Uh, because the, the charge fluctuations, they're fast, right? So they just wiggle around. But the center of mass motion should be determined by the dispersion of the spin-on. And if you look at the dispersion relation of these spin-ons um, at the optimized flux for this uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet, um, this cut looks a, a lot like, qualitatively at least, a lot like the cut uh, we saw before, how the, the, the actual magnetic polaron dispersion looks like. If you compare this to other fluxes like zero flux or pi flux, 
uh, this is very different from, from this structure, right? Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to use this trial wave function, actually calculate the dispersion um, using Monte Carlo sampling, and um, you get these green uh, dots, basically. And the key take-home message is that uh, the dispersion relation we get from this trial wave function indeed looks a lot like the um, dispersion of the, the known dispersion of these magnetic polarons. In particular, we get the minimum at pi over 2, uh, pi over 2. Okay, we're running out of time. You can do the same with energy. It looks pretty uh, decent if you compare to quantum Monte Carlo. Yeah, no, I, have sl I have slides. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. We give an extra minute because you haven't participated oh. in this dialogue. Yes. Okay. That's that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, okay. So the take-home message is that this trial wave function does a pretty decent job in, in describing the strong coupling uh, regime of these magnetic polarons. Okay. So um, now, of course, we would like to uh, test this, right? I mean, at this point, okay, I, I reproduced some of the known properties of these uh, of these bound states. Um, but we really want to see, are there direct signatures of these strings? Um, and so the idea is the following. Um, the, the whole philosophy of this trial wave function that we use is that we have a superposition of different string configurations. Um, and that means to really see these strings, we, we have to look at individual snapshots. Because if you don't do that, and if you basically average over many snapshots, you always expect some liquid-like uh, correlations, simply because the, you average over all different possible directions of these strings, and there are exponentially many possible orientations of these strings. OK, and that's really the key motivation to look at uh, single snapshots. So then the question is, what can we do? And so here's what we did. So Anava actually did some uh, DMRG simulations on a um, cylinder on 8x8. Eight eight, and she took a, a single hole, uh, put it on, on the cylinder. And at first, we pinned the hole. So the, the, the hole did, did, was not allowed to move. Um, and this is all zero temperature. Um, and then. Uh, we basically sampled um, and looked at snapshots in the Fock basis, exactly like a quantum gas microscope would do. Right? It would take s s snapshots with the probability distribution given by this ground state wave function. Um, and then in these snapshots, we look at the difference to the, to the perfect Niels uh, uh, state. And so you know, sometimes um, the next to this hole, there is a deviation from this perfect Niels pattern. And um, this we would label uh, as a string. So when a deviation uh, appears next to this hole, uh, we call this a string. <coughs> And now we analyze these string patterns and basically ask, uh, how likely are certain string lengths to show up? And so again, this is for the pinned uh, hole, so it doesn't move. And indeed, most of the time, uh, we get a zero length string. And that means the hole is basically happily sitting in this pretty good uh, antiferromagnetic background. Um, sometimes you also get two and four and six and so on. And the idea is simply, um, imagine you, you have the hole here and you have two spins and they're in a nice configuration. But now we know the super exchange. Uh, exchanges those, um, and that means these two sides become red because you know both now deviate from the uh, checkerboard pattern, and that's why the you know two and four and the even ones show up more often than the uh, the other ones. But you know there's some background noise. Okay, and now the question is, what happens if these uh, holes can move around? So um, the idea is again we we take the same snapshots for the pinned holes, and we're going to move we take we take the hole and we artificially move it around in these snapshots thereby basically generating a second bunch of snapshots. And you know, let's call them fake snapshots. Okay? And uh, the way we're going to move around the hole is basically uh, moving it in random directions. But according to the string length probability distribution that we uh, calculated before from this uh, analytic theory. If we do this, uh, we get different results for these uh, string counts. For tunneling is 3j or 0.9j. And you can see it always broadens dramatically. So these longer strings are much more likely to show up. Um, and uh, there, it, you know, it also depends on t over j. And the most important comparison, of course, now is with the actual DMRG. So uh, now we basically do the same DMRG simulations, but with a, a mobile hole, which is actually moving, generate the true snapshots, and then basically again look for the string patterns. And you can see these uh, uh, simple uh, fake pictures from before describe very well where the actual DMRG data lands. And um, this is um, a pretty nice signature, I would say, for uh, something like uh, short range hidden string order in these models. Um, and we can really describe them by this geometric paradigm of just uh, moving around uh, this background spin state um, according to this string length distribution that we calculate. OK, if on the other hand you look at uh, three point correlation functions like Christian did, indeed, um, so this is a zero temperature calculation, basically looking at these local uh, uh, nearest neighbor uh, or diagonal correlations as a function of distance. And you can see if you go further away from uh, from the uh, charge, um, you 
recover the background. And the way this looks is, is like this expected um, universal liquid-like uh, behavior, right? So here it's very hard to directly see the strings, but the strings are a way of actually describing how this um, behavior looks like. Okay, um, so now of course there are the experiments. One is the experiment by Christian that you just saw before, so I can actually be quick. Here I'm just pointing out these uh, diagonal correlations directly next to the charge go negative. And a simple way of understanding this um, is actually, uh, again, from this geometric paradigm. So imagine you have a hole that didn't move yet, um, and you look at these two spins. So they have a nearest neighbor spin correlator, C1, which is strongly negative. And now we move the hole around, we create the string, we look at this diagonal correlator, this is still the same C1 uh, of the background um, that is strongly negative, and that's exactly in the end what gives rise to the strong negative anti-correlations. Um, and in Markus Greiner's experiment, and Christy is going to talk about it in the next talk, um, they measured this as a function of doping, so now not fully spin resolved, um, but as a function of doping. And again, you can see that these diagonal correlators at large doping, they change sign and go negative. And um, the understanding from the string uh, approach is exactly the same. And in fact, if you look at the solid green line here, that's basically the string theory. And it predicts even quantitatively correctly at this finite temperature, uh, where exactly uh, these next nearest neighbor correlations change sign. Um, so one thing we did here is also we compared to a uh, RVB pi flux ansatz, so that's this dashed line. You can see that also describes this uh, situation fairly well. So the key thing here is that, so this pi flux theory is basically not having any strings in there, right? So um, that, that's a more conventional ansatz, if you, if you wish. Um, so now, you know, seeing this, one might ask the question, what is it then? Is it, you know, this kind of hidden order that we kind of discuss? Or is it more uh, this Anderson type RVB state? And uh, one, one thing in this direction we did is, uh, so Annabelle also did this. She um, applied machine learning codes to the experimental data in Marcus's group. And we, what we did is we basically trained a network to distinguish between these two theories. And then we take the experimental data and sort it into the two different categories and basically ask, does the experimental data look more like one theory or like the other theory? And you can see in, in let's say, some, some, something between 60 and 80 or 70 percent of the cases, this experimental data actually goes to this um, string uh, uh, type of theory up to something like 15 percent doping. And at something like 15 percent doping, let's say, you know, it changes or you can't really distinguish them that well anymore. Um, and so this suggests that um, indeed, at, at least at small doping, this, this, this idea of these short range uh, hidden string orders is actually a good one. Okay, a second possible future direction is to use analogies with lattice gauge theories. Um, there is also a proposal uh, how, how you can implement uh, lattice gauge theories and study basically these um, uh, lattice gauge theories using ultra cold atoms. And so the reason I'm showing this is just to show you that uh, I think ultra cold atoms are exploring a completely new um, regime. Um, and so um, this is, uh, you know, the, the last plot, uh, uh, slide. The idea is if you look at this, this is, let's say, the temporal resolution that your experiment has. This is the spatial resolution of the experiments. Then uh, solid state really works here. There's always, um, uh, you always basically measure over long times. That means all the probes like STM or ARPRIS uh, are frequency resolved. And quantum gas microscopes really uh, work in this regime where you have full temporal and spatial resolution, you take instant snapshots. And I think this will really uh, open up a completely new perspective on, in particular, on, uh, on this field of seeing partons and seeing the, the constituents that in the end make up this uh, emergent, strongly correlated physics of, uh, of let's say, high TC Cooper rates and all these interesting models. OK, with this, I want to close, uh, close and uh, thank all the people involved. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Yes. That fits better than the unconventional state. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sorry for that. Yes. Ah, there. <laughs>
in some sense, we are presenting results from this platform, but when you question about standard atomic dynamics in the future, you will be having an algorithm to deal with ground state results. It must be interesting for that people to be comparing with the ground state itself. Um, Any ideas about it? Well, so dynamics would certainly be interesting. Um, I agree that if you, for instance, take a charge and let it go, it, it, it should oscillate for some while. But I would also say that I, I, I don't think that thermalization would be hindered in, in that dramatically, right? Because in the end, uh, even if you have these spin-ons and charge-ons bound by strings, they also couple to the spin background, right? And let's say the background, let's say, has either a conventional Magnon excitation, something like that, and that should always give a uh, thermalization channel. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's mine, actually. Back to this one, yeah. I think there's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one is mine. Other questions? Yes. Make so, yes. So, so the naive picture when you think about these strings is that the strings look like the polar one. Yeah. But but that's not what's happening. So you get dispersion and everything. So now in a, so what is your answer to this question? What ultimately de localized de localizes the polar one? Is it mm -hmm. the, I mean, here it's the spin-on, right? Because the idea is that you have a, this bound state of the spin-on and the charge-on, and the string is really describing these uh, fast fl fluctuations of the charge-on relative to the spin-on. And then the idea is that the spin-on is moving around, and thereby also the center of mass is moving around. And that, in the end, of course, is driven by spin exchange, right? The spin-on motion, let's say. So you're saying that the spin fluctuations of the underlying Heisenberg, that they heal this motion again. Yes. That's, That's the microscopic <coughs> way of saying that, yeah. <laughs> Well, the idea, if you, so you can come up with a tight binding model of it, but then it's more tight binding for the spin-on. So let, let's say the spin-on is the end of the string, and then if you have, let's say, you know, up, down, and then you have a spin exchange here, that kind of makes the string longer. And so if you want to make that more or less quantitative, you have to uh, think of this charge as ver being very delocalized. The spin-on can hop, and then when it hops, you have a Frank Condon type of uh, overlap factor because of this long fluctuating string. So it's, you know, it's certain, your picture, is, I would say, is true for the spin-on, uh, and the charge-on kind of dresses up this tight binding spin-on motion. I know that Carlos is playing the role of Bill Phillips, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe uh, Marcus gets the last what, question. What, uh, uh, to, to what extent is this limited to um, fundamental questions? Uh, is it linked to fundamental questions like uh, whether superconductivity or pseudo gap uh, competes with the magnetism or emerges from the magnetism? I mean, I think the what I set out to write is to try to get more microscopic understanding of the individual charges in order to answer those questions. Um, I'm, you know, I, I can't say what this suggests, but um, um, I mean, those yeah, those are going to be the questions one can answer, and the hope is that these microscopic details will provide more insights into but, but how the they interplay. But the picture, but the picture is one. Mm -hmm. The intuitive picture here would be that uh, that you have magnetism and this, uh, uh, the strings define the dynamics uh, within that, and you mm -hmm. have actually more hidden order in the, for example, pseudo gap or polar one of these kind of things, right? Or so I think for the pseudo gap, this um, idea of subir, right, that you have these bound states of, of spin ons and charge ons, is very appealing to me. It seems to give, or let's say, this FL star. It gives the right phenomenology, at, like the Fermi arcs and so on. Um, and this microscopic description of basically these bound states seems to support the idea that there's a bound state of these objects, right? Um, so the pseudo gap seems to be the most closest to what we discussed. And then, you know, you should go to stripes and uh, superconductivity and see how, you know, that comes. We're going to get all of the answers tomorrow. Anyway, um, Peter, maybe I'll, I'll give you, since you're visiting IPAC. <laughs> Question. How much differences would there be if you had a full fermion model of the charge itself and the spin model? Um, I mean, the paradigms that we use should apply here um, in the sense that, um, I mean, so if, you know, if you, I think Christy will also talk a bit about this, right? So. At least if the Hubbard U is large, you would think that the main difference of the actual fermionic nature of these 
things uh, will be that you have these Dublin hole fluctuations. <coughs> they wouldn't change these pictures qualitatively. Um, and then, of course, I think the next most important thing is that I didn't really, uh, I looked at single bound states here of one, you know, charge on one spin on. And as soon as you have more of them, their fermionic nature becomes important. And then, you know, it's really more than just the spin model. And, yeah. Thank you, uh, thanking uh, Fabian and all of the other speakers.